in listen only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic will cover all aspects of poinsettia production. My name is Rebecca Simmonsma. Also joining us today is Dr. Alan Hammer. We are both technical specialists with the Duman Group representing Red Fox and Equi Poinsettias. Before we get started with the webinar, I do want to mention that we are recording today's session and it will be available approximately 24 hours, 24 hours after the session for viewing. So, you know, if you have growers in your greenhouse that weren't able to attend or you yourself want to go back and reference, the, the session will be available. As with most of the webinars that we do, uh, you, can, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. That doesn't mean that we don't want you to ask as many questions as time allows using the question and answer toolbar to the right of your screen. Uh, you can just type the question in, I'll see it, and then we'll stop periodically throughout the presentation to address any questions. We have you for about an hour today, and so we will address as many questions as that hour allows. Otherwise, if there's unanswered questions, uh, we'll address those via email after today's session. So for today's session, I mentioned that we'll be talking all about poinsettia propagation. The topics that we'll cover in depth will be uh, the time before sticking and preparation, sticking, mist management, fertility and height management, insect and disease management, and common problems in propagation. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Hammer, and he's going to get us started with the preparation for sticking. Uh, well, I will say welcome to... Uh, this is uh, putting together the uh, the Duman group now with uh, Red Fox and Eki poinsettias, which is a uh, which is a nice uh, nice group of poinsettias now with uh, varying uh, varying uh, attributes, and uh, so we'll uh, we'll point out most of those attributes, uh, how they fit and how they differ uh, as we go through. Uh, but we start with the the first thing is uh, environmental management. Uh, and certainly, uh, you need to, uh, I, as I say, I mean, I, hopefully everything we say today is just completely uh, review for all of you. Uh, but as I say, every poinsettia season or every mum season or ever whatever season, it's good to sit down and just go through the go through the stuff we know again to remind us stuff. Uh, the, the thing I find is uh, it's so easy to. Uh, you know, you've done it 10 years and you think that everything is perfect and you know exactly how to do it and uh, I find even after a, a lot more years than that that I need to go through and revisit everything every year. So so think about all of these things uh, and certainly the environmental management is critical. I mean, you want to do that, uh, you want to think about it before you go into the greenhouse stick cuttings. And the thing that you need to think about is what environment do you need for propagation of poinsettias. So, next one. Uh, temperature is is absolutely critical, and we think that this time of year, we often think that it's just summertime and it's hot, and we don't have to think about temperature. But actually, uh, and I always say that uh, I wish I could travel with one of these uh, one of these uh, thermometers. Uh, but uh, you see it's kind of pointed in, and I don't like them on airplanes, but uh, every grower that's certainly in propagation or even just grower should have one of these in their pocket all the time. And as I always say, when you go in, you can't look at media and tell what the temperature is, so you really have to monitor it. And it's surprising, even in July and August, some nights can get to be a lot colder than you think they are, and you're using all the water, so you're getting a lot of evaporation, and so root media temperature uh, is extremely important. So you really want to pay attention to the temperature. Light levels. Uh, you really need to, to look at these light levels uh, at 12 1,200 to 1,500 foot candles. Uh, you don't want to have less than that because when you get less than that, then you, you actually slow down rooting and you cause stretch and you cause weak cuttings. Uh, if you get more than that, uh, you have to put too much water on and you can burn the leaves uh, and make the leaves uh, not happy. But so the light level is critical and 
the thing the 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 nicest thing if you've got movable shade, uh, you can you can really play games with this and and have the ideal elves all the time. Uh, if you don't have movable shade, I would say the the thing you really want to do is you've got to really watch that maximum. So you've got those really bright days. So you really have to go towards the bright days, and then sort of the the dark days, uh, which are far less in the summertime. Uh, you you probably may be lower than you want to be, but if you want to err, you err on the side of reducing. Make sure you don't have too much light. Then uh, I'd rather have a little too low too little light on certain days than, uh, than too much light too much light on uh, you know from 12 to three o'clock in the afternoon on a, on a really bright day uh, because it, you just have to put too much mist on and the mist uh, too much water is not good for poinsettias uh, rooting cuttings for sure uh, and as with temperature you can't guess you can't guess at light. Uh, I, none, of us, none of us have the ability to, to really define uh, what the light levels are. So again, uh, you really need to have a light meter to make sure that you measure the light and understand exactly what the light level is. Uh, temperature management. Uh, for we, we see callus formation, uh, 70, 75 degrees. Uh, and again, you need to you need to monitor that root media temperature. Uh, you can't guess at that, and it may be uh, you know it, it may be 90 degrees during the day, and you feel like that uh, it, it just everything is perfect. But remember, the middle of the night can be very different than uh, that hot sunny day. Day temperatures, uh, if possible, uh, less than 82. Uh, I know there are some days that uh, that's the outer camera shade you put on. It's uh, in some places uh, that 82 is, is tough, but it's cool. Uh, certainly, you'd like to try to be no more than 82 if you can. Uh, night temperatures uh, 70, 74, and again, you've got that. You know, you got that problem of that night temperature that uh, is uh, can get to be cold, and uh, you really need to pay attention to that. I, I Unfortunately, uh, when you're rooting poinsettias, we always say that uh, yeah, it seems it seems silly to have the boiler on in the middle of the summer, but there are some nights that you really need to have the boiler on, and a cold night, cold root temperature can really can really really affect uh, the rooting. So you really need to pay attention to it, even in even in as I say, July August. Uh, temperatures below uh, 80 in the first five days, uh, you see, will reduce uh, arwenia. Uh, when yeah, is uh, it's one of those pathogens that are around uh, that uh, it can be a problem under uh, you know when you get real cold. So uh, or when you get real hot, uh, the uh, the temperature uh, as we say there, the temperature outside that optimum range slows rooting, reduces uniformity, and uh, and just it, it doesn't improve rooting when you've got those. Uh, Either too hot or too cold temperatures, and we'd say week three. Uh, at week three, you can turn the bottom heat off. You got bottom heat, uh, and you can begin to reduce, it, uh, reduce the temperature. But those first three weeks, it's important that you maintain those uh, root media temperatures and greenhouse temperatures to uh, to control uh, the rooting. Humidity, uh, certainly we want to say uh, there needs to be, particularly early on in rooting, it needs to be in 90% range. And you need to pay attention to things like airflow and uh, because often I go into uh, the rooting areas and you've got airflow fans, which we really like to have in production, but then you've got airflow fans in a mist system and you're really draw, you're blowing the mist around, uh, and you've got areas that uh, you're not you reducing the humidity in and stuff. So, really want to pay attention to that. Uh, sometimes it's best to probably just turn the uh, turn the mist uh, turn those uh, circulating fans off when you're trying, particularly those first three weeks when you're trying to root. Uh, when you're just trying to when you freshly stuck cuttings and you're trying to get them rooted, and and as I say. Doors, open doors. It's just amazing in a way when you go into green. Now think about the microclimate. Look at air movements, because actually when you're rooting poinsettias, you would like to have 
that high humidity and you'd like to maintain that high humidity without putting a, having to put a lot of extra water on. So that's the reason for watching watching those air movements is so you maintain that that humidity dome over those cuttings uh, and as uniformly as possible so you don't get those dry spots and wet spots and, and uneven rooting. In low humidity, uh, often you see you see a picture here is uh, burned leaves and spots on the leaves and stuff, and uh, that's uh, those can often be caused by uh, just too low humidity. Uh, this stresses that leaf and causes uh, causes the leaf burn and, and uh, not a not a happy plant as you can see here. Sanitation, uh, again, uh, sanitation is, is extremely important. Uh, and we say power wash the greenhouse uh, and disinfect with green shield, chlorine, or Fysan, or some of those. Uh, the cleanliness of the area you're sticking is important. Uh, as we said, we mentioned Erwinia, and the thing that we realize all the time is Erwinia is, as I always say, Erwinia is everywhere. Now uh, you have to believe that it's everywhere, and so you really want to clean that up and not have it on any surfaces when you're before you're sticking, or when you're handling the cutting. So, so the sanitation, previous uh, prior to uh, sticking poinsettias is absolutely critical. Don't forget the carts you use. Uh, you put cuttings on carts. You put flats on carts. Uh, don't forget those things, and then you know you go back to 101 sanitation in the greenhouse. Uh, remember the the floor is dirty, and the benches should be clean, and everything the cutting touches should be clean. So uh, it's it's really important that that sanitation you do the you do the proper job of sanitation. Weeds, uh, the weed area there is uh, you know weeds are the primary uh, source of uh, thrips and uh, white fly and those kind of things, so get them out the greenhouse before you stick the poinsettias in. Uh, the, the trick, uh, and, and I've, uh, I know Eki has always done this, uh, but I've, I've recommended it uh, lots and lots of times myself, is uh, line the floors and line them under the benches uh, and it really does help the fungus snap problem, particularly for poinsettia rooting. Uh, it certainly has a monstrous uh, help on, on mm -hmm. thrips and things that, uh, those kind of bugs that uh, live in the soil. So, uh, so fungus snap larvae and fungus gnats and thrips, uh, shore flies, uh, which shore flies are just a nuisance, but they're a nuisance that you don't want to have around. So lining the floors tremendously, uh, tremendously help. The, Recommendations on lime, uh, just to uh, to remind you, is uh, uh, 50 pound bags of uh, three 50 pound bags of lime and 50 gallons of water, and then use that as a slurry to uh, to cover. Uh, you can uh, say here we can add copper sulfite to the slurry, and that'll help in algae control. The one thing I would also say is. Uh, I, I know a number of growers that actually put it down dry. Uh, you can put it down dry. If you do that, uh, I would suggest you've got to be careful with uh, proper equipment with eye protection and uh, you know probably uh, you need a dust mask then. But you can put it down. Uh, it should be hydrated lime though. We're talking about hydrated lime that, uh, that will effectively uh, do that uh, algae control and uh, bug control that you need to do under the benches. Uh, seems like a seems like a uh, you know again it's not something that uh, we're talking to the choir in a way, but you really need to plan the layer plan the labor. Uh, the the thing is that we know that poinsettias you get a lot of poinsettia cuttings in at one time. Uh, they need to be really stuck. Uh, you can't stick them in the cooler for two days and uh, sort of plan the sticking over a two or three day period. So, uh, so you really need to plan the labor, schedule the labor. Uh, say, watch for truck alerts and track shipments. Uh, that uh, they, there's pretty good tracking now. That so you should know where the cuttings are and when they're going to arrive. And uh, you really need to pay attention to that. Uh, I think the next slide uh, we talk about. Uh, well, we'll get. To, I'll get to the other one in a minute. But uh, anyway, prepare the media. Uh, 
free web the media one day prior to stick uh, and uh, on the direct stick pots we say double the hole one day prior to stick uh, and that's the way everything you have everything ready to do and and it's it makes the cutting it makes sticking so much quicker when everything is right ready uh, the one thing the comment there is try not to uh, pre wet the media too early uh, because then it dries out and you got to come back and, and wet it again. Then the other problem is that fungus gnats, uh, they love to, uh, you know, you get a bunch of wet media around and that's just a, it's sort of like a candy store. So uh, so you really want to not do that too early. The the one day is really the area we, we talk about. Uh, and here here's where I was going to uh, talk about this uh, cuttings. Uh, it's best to stick the cuttings uh, as soon as they arrive, uh, and but the the thing I would suggest here is a couple things. Number one, if the cuttings come in hot, uh, you know, and we try our best not to send hot cuttings. We don't like hot cuttings. You don't like hot cuttings, uh, but sometimes FedEx uh, doesn't uh, doesn't get them there as cool as we'd like them. I would say if they come in hot, you're much better off to uh, stick them in the cooler. And probably missed them a little bit. Open the boxes. Stick them. Stick them in the boxes in the cooler doesn't help. But open the boxes. The best thing to do is to take the bags out, put them on carts, clean carts, uh, and then miss the bag. Open the bags and miss them, and give them a chance to to cool off again and rehydrate a little bit, and uh, that will help. But the problem is, if they come in, if they come in nice and cool and and turgid, sticking them quickly is fine. The other thing you say, we say store in the cooler for uh, 50 degrees, and, and I would say if they're hot, they need to stay in the cooler until they're cool again. Uh, the, the other thing I'll mention to you, and, and we, I, I suggest this, is, uh, is you can stick them in the cooler if they arrive, particularly if they arrive late in the afternoon. Sometimes I think you're better off to stick them in the cooler and stick them you know, real early starting the next morning, uh, because then you can plan your labor better. Uh, certainly, it's cooler in the greenhouse, uh, and the cuttings are more turgid. So, I, you know, pay attention to that. It depends on when you, how early in the morning you get your cuttings, and how late you get your cuttings, and how, you know, how much you have to wait for the delivery, and those kind of things. But stick them in the stick them in the cooler overnight. Uh, as long as you open the boxes, I mean, sticking boxes in the cooler doesn't help. But as long as you open the boxes, open the bags, put them on carts, stick them in overnight, maybe a uh, maybe a better deal uh, than uh, rushing to to stick uh, wilted cuttings. The cooler, you you really need to pay attention to it. Is the cooler can be awful drying, so you may need to right, uh, wet the floor, uh, keep the humidity up at least seventy percent. Uh, and then the other thing we do say is that. You know, if you get a big batch of cuttings, is you really don't want to put the ones that you're not sticking in the cooler. Don't leave them in the greenhouse. Uh, stick them in the cooler so that uh, you maintain them. And you know, don't store them for 24. And here you see too many cuttings. You see, you, you see that amount of cuttings out in the greenhouse, and it really doesn't help to have them. Even if you got real heavy shade, you got all those bags laid out, and those are absorbing heat, and those are wilting. I mean, there's no question. And, they would be, uh, you know, three fourths of those cuttings in this case should be in the cooler instead of laying out the greenhouse for waiting to be stuck. And you see, uh, yeah, stick them early in the morning uh, is, to me, is still the better approach. Is stick them in the cooler overnight. Stick them, particularly, if, like I say, if they don't arrive early in the morning, uh, be ready. Stick them in the morning when it's a little cooler and. Uh, that's a much better approach to uh, to the cuttings. All right, thank you, Alan. We do have several questions that have come in. Um, I sort of glanced through the questions, and a lot of the questions we'll be addressing throughout the webinar. So I'll try to stick to the ones that pertain now mostly to preparation for sticking. Alan, the first question that has come in uh, relates to using chlorine for disinfectant. disinfectant. Uh, this particular grower has used it in the past, but on occasion they do see some chlorine toxicity, which poinsettias are sensitive to, and they're wondering if we have some kind of guidelines in terms of the number of days prior to sticking that you should use chlorine disinfectants. Yeah, I'd say those are those are those are tough questions to answer. Uh, 
I mean, I think the main problem I've seen with chlorine is, uh, you know, it causes black stems on, on poinsettias. I, I, my guess is that uh, once you put the chlorine on, I mean, once it becomes fairly dry, it shouldn't be, it should have pretty well dissipated by then. I think where the, where the problem I see is when you dip things in chlorine and you use them immediately, uh, because chlorine actually, you know, it, it dissipates fairly quickly. It's, it's pretty much a gas, so it dissipates pretty quickly. So I think most of the thing is, uh, is you need to dip it, uh, and actually if you can rinse it, it's the better thing. Just dip it in chlorine, rinse it in clear water, and set it up and let it dry, uh, I, I would say at least overnight to, to get rid of, to, so it dissipates the chlorine. Yeah, I would agree. I would just say pay attention to drying conditions. And if, you know, and this is where planning comes into play. If you are using the chlorine, um, you know, a couple days before sticking and the environment's humid and drying conditions are poor, then you're going to have some trouble. But you want to make sure that all that disinfecting is done when, you know, the greenhouse is nice and dry and it can dissipate. So, um, you know, and generally then it shouldn't create an issue. The next question is about herbicide use. Um, again, poinsettias are incredibly sensitive to herbicides. Um, are we aware of any herbicides that are safe to use um, in or around the greenhouse when poinsettias are going to be used? Or in our opinion, is it best to just stay away from herbicides altogether? Well, I mean, I, yeah, herbicides I always take a, a very harsh view of herbicides because I basically say, I and mean, although there's some risk for the greenhouse, I typically say if you can avoid using them, avoid using them because I've seen herbicide damage from everything. Uh, certainly the, the safest one to use would be Roundup uh, as long as you don't get uh, overspray or, you know, Roundup tends not to be volatile. The volatility is a problem with most of them. Uh, but again, I've seen problem with Roundup. You put Roundup on on uh, wood and set plants on it. If they got roots out the bottom, uh, you get damage. So, uh, so I, the best thing to do is, uh, if you're going to use them, use uh, use Roundup early, get rid of the weeds, and then during the poinsettias, I would I would not use herbicides. I, I wouldn't use any of them personally. Yeah, herbicides can be tricky because uh, they can continue to volatize. Even, uh, you know, products like Roundup that don't for very long can continue even months after the application. And you'll get situations where you get, you know, like a microclimate within the greenhouse where airflow is reduced around a certain number of plants or, you know, little pockets where it can volatize even months later and then you can see herbicide damage. And it kind of leaves a grower scratching their head because it's been months. But... Um, we do see it, and so the safest thing is to, you know, keep the greenhouse weed free, and the lime will help with that as well, um, you know, but pulling weeds and keeping the greenhouse weed free that way rather than relying on herbicide is generally a safer way to go. So another question uh, relating to pre-wetting the media. This grower is asking if for some reason they have pre-wet a batch of media uh, one week and then they don't end up using it all. Is it safe to use the media the following week if you drench with something like zero tall or a green shield, or do we just not want to reuse that media or use it after it's been pre-wet for so long? No, I would. I, I mean, I think it's okay to, to reuse it. I mean, it's just that uh, by if it's been pre-wet that long, it's probably dry again, so we're probably going to have to re-wet it. Uh, would be my guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just look at it and make sure that uh, you know you don't see a bunch of fungus gnats uh, flying around and stuff. And if you don't see that, then I think yeah, it's perfectly okay to reuse it. Or algae growth. Algae growth. Or algae, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, it, if it's been really sopping wet and you get algae or fungus gnats on it, then, then I think you got to do something to try to control those. But typically, if you re-wet and it's a hot greenhouse, it's probably a dry after a week. You'll have to re-wet it anyway before you stick. Yep. All right, we've addressed all the questions related to pre-plant. So I'm going to go ahead and move on in the presentation. We'll talk now about the actual sticking process. Um, as Ellen mentioned, a good thing to stick ASAP or to utilize the cooler if the cuttings have been stressed and then uh, stage your labor and plan accordingly. First thing we'll talk about is rooting hormone. Um, we do feel that rooting hormone en enhances uniformity and decreases the time to rooting on a poinsettia, uh, so there is some benefits to using it. A good example um, of, a, of a product of choice that a lot of growers use would be dip and grow, which is a combination of IBA and NAA. Uh, we do like to steer growers towards the powder formulation uh, just because when you're using the liquid formulations it can spread disease. Um, you know those waterborne or pathogens that are spread with splashing water can be easily spread from cutting to cutting if you're utilizing that. And even though you, you know a lot of growers 
use the liquid formulation and switch out the rooting hormone after a certain batch of cuttings, um, you know, there is still the risk that you could spread disease. So powder formulation is definitely, um, you know, it's effective and less risky from that standpoint. You rapid dip the cutting um, in the cutting powder, powder just like you would with the liquid. And then just pay close attention to the fact that, you know, any exposed leaves and petioles to the rooting hormone can result in twisting and distortion. Uh, we do see this happen sometimes where, you know, you get a group of workers that aren't experienced sticking cuttings or, you know, haven't been trained properly and they expose the cuttings to too much rooting hormone. Generally, the cuttings look kind of funny for a couple weeks um, and then they do come out of it. But I have seen it where it was severe enough that it, you know, it actually slowed rooting because of the distortion that they saw. So you want to be careful there. Some growers are trialing the use of a KIBA or potassium spray after sticking. The caution I would say here is trial first. Um, it has been most commonly used on uh, geraniums, uh, but we have you know, I've visited some growers, and I know Alan mentioned this also, that he's seen some growers that have actually got some burn when using the KIBA. And the IBA is in combination with potassium salts, and so there is the risk there for burn. Uh, if you wanted to trial it, the rate would be 100 parts per million. It can be applied up to seven days after sticking. And where you would consider doing this is, uh, you know, if you saw some, if you hadn't used rooting hormone and you had some leaf loss that was the result of uh, shipping stress or stress in the propagation environment, applying that KIBA, you know, up to seven days after sticking could help um, speed rooting and reduce the amount of stress to the cuttings or the, re the result that you would see in terms of slow rooting. It can be tank mixed with fungicides also. So, you know, if you, like with, the, with most of your common uh, botrytis fungicides and propagation, it can be tank mixed. But again, the message here is trial first because it isn't that commonly used on poinsettias. Sticking order is a, a good one to pay attention to, and this, this goes back to, you know, where Alan talked about taking only a certain amount of cuttings out of the cooler at a time. Know what's in your boxes and stage the cuttings before you stick, so that way you can put out, you know, there are certain dark leaf cultivars that are more sensitive to stress and some light leaf cultivars and novelties that show more um, stress and sensitivity to botrytis. And so you want to make sure that those are stuck first, and, you know, if you're sticking large batches and it's going to take all day to stick, do the sensitive ones in the morning and then work your way down the line as the day goes on. This picture here is an example. Freedom Red is actually one that we recommend sticking first because it is sensitive to stress. And you can see there's a light leaf cultivar all the way around uh, that Freedom and it showed some stress because it, it, you know, it was stuck at a warmer part of the day and held longer before it was stuck and now it's not rebounding as quickly. So in terms of sticking order, uh, just general rule, you want to stick your sensitive varieties first. Most light leaf cultivars, uh, like Visions of Grandeur, Glacé, Pink Cadillac, the Peter Stars, those are all ones that are pretty sensitive to botrytis, and so we want to get those stuck first. Novelties like Ice Punch and Tapestry can be sensitive, and then certain dark leaf cultivars like Freedom, uh, maybe even Prestige or Prestige Early Red would benefit from being higher up on the list in terms of sticking order. So we want to pay close attention to um, sticking depth, especially when we're sticking in strips. Um, if the sticking depth is too deep, the farther the cutting goes down in that cell, the less amount of oxygen there is. And when we have a reduced amount of oxygen, that can slow rooting. Uh, the other problem is if that last petiole is stuck below the media, you can actually lose that leaf. It'll yellow and senesce if it's stuck below the media. And then that's going to create a, a situation where we end up with botrytis and further disease. So we want to pay close attention to sticking depth. And here's a good picture of that. You can see the cutting to the left just stuck too deep. There's going to be reduced oxygen um, on that cutting on the left, and that petiole is below the surface, and you're going to lose that leaf. Um, you know, and five, ten days down the road into propagation, when that leaf senesces, if it isn't, if you don't go back and through and clean, we're going to end up with botrytis that can easily spread, spread to the rest of the cuttings. So. Um, the other thing you want to be careful of is that you're not pinching the cutting too hard or that you're training workers to not pinch the cutting too hard when they're sticking. You know, it is sensitive tissue, and so if they're pinching it too hard when they stick, you can actually damage the stem, and then we talk about things like botrytis and possibly even Irwinia in those early days. It's also important to make sure that tips are uncovered while sticking. Uh, you know, the last leaf on those poinsettias, and we do a a pretty good job of trying to maintain a small leaf size on the cuttings for a number of reasons. But if they're not stuck properly, you're still going to see some overlap of leaves that cover tips of the adjacent cutting. 
And so you want to stick so that all tips are uncovered, uh, because if the tip is covered to, on the next cutting, that's going to slow rooting, and you'll end, on, uh, you'll end up with um, ununiform rooting times. But also, that tip can actually abort if it's covered, if it's shaded enough. And so um, you want to go back through and tuck leaves after the cuttings are stuck as well. So once they start to put on new leaves, you know, once every few days, you'll want to have people go back through and tuck leaves and make sure that the tips aren't uh, covered. And here's a good picture of tips that are covered. There's at least five or six cuttings there where the growing tip is covered, and it's either going to delay rooting or it's going to abort the tip, and then that cutting won't be viable for use later. Here's a picture now where all the leaves are, you know, stuck so that the tips aren't covered, and then if you go back through and periodically tuck leaves, we can avoid problems like this. So this, these next series of pictures is a um, sequence of the, you know, the rooting cycle of the cutting from day three all the way to finish. Uh, this is day three here where the cuttings regained its turgidity and it's starting to actively grow. And in some cases, um, you know, you can actually see callus formation starting on some of these cuttings. At day three, as Alan mentioned before, we can start to increase the night or uh, increase the night temperature. We're past the period where Erwinia should be an issue. The cuttings should be turgid, and they can handle a little bit warmer temperature. Day 7 through 10, we should have nice callus formation that's entirely encompassed the base of the cutting. Uh, you should start to be seeing some uh, root initials at this point. And then we want to watch misting frequency close. Um, before callus formation, the cutting really can't take up much for moisture from the stem and the leaves. And so, uh, at, I'm sorry, at that point it's relying solely on what it takes up through the stem and the leaves, and it can't take it up through the media. Once you have callus formation, you can actually get some absorption of water and nutrients through the callus formation. And so, you know, at that point, we can start to probably back off on mist once we've got callus formation. And then with some of your more vigorous cultivars, day 7 through 10, it's time to start looking at growth regulator applications because you may start to begin to see some stretch. This is day 20 here where you should have roots, um, you know, emerging from the cell and starting to circle. They're still not completely um, recovered from the stresses of, you know, shipping and everything like or, I mean, they should be recovered at that point, but they're still not completely ready to go off mist, uh, not completely ready to take up all of their moisture from the media. And so misting may be necessary at this point. Um, light intensities can be increased lightly. Uh, just so we can start toning that cutting. But when you increase those light intensities, make sure you watch closely and make sure that you're supplying enough moisture to compensate for the higher light. Um, it definitely should be stopped at night by day 20, and, and definitely we recommend before that if possible, but that's going to vary depending on individual environments. Uh, some growers are able to have them off the mist by day 20 altogether. It just depends on, you know, how quickly they root in your individual greenhouses. And then PGRs, Probably you will be on your second application for your vigorous varieties, uh, and maybe you've only had to do one on, on um, your, big, your varieties that are less vigorous. And then here we have day 28, and this cutting is ready to ship. We're not going to spend a lot of time on direct sticking today. Um, we could probably do a whole other webinar just on direct sticking because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a complex um, topic, but we'll just cover the basics of direct sticking and then uh, possibly some questions will come in that we can address. One of the most important um, things about direct sticking is just to make sure that the, um, the soil is moist before sticking, but not completely saturated, that it is moist, and to dibble a hole. Uh, I visit a lot of growers that are direct sticking that aren't dibbling a hole, and you know you can damage that cutting um, when you stick it down into the soil, and then also you don't get a nice air pocket around the base of the cutting, which is, uh, you know, which can actually inhibit rooting. Um, and so it is a good idea to dibble that hole. And in the next slide, I'll show a picture of a simple dibbler that can be created if you don't have one. We don't recommend to water the cutting in after it's stuck. Um, that kind of fills in that airspace around the base of the cutting. And then, again, it can actually inhibit rooting because the oxygen level is so low. So what we actually recommend to do is dibble the hole in that medium um, moistened soil to a medium level, stick the cutting in, and then one week later come back in and water it in and just rely on misting until that point to, um, so that there's good airflow around the base of the cutting and still moisture availability. After callus formation is when we would water in with a nutrient uh, solution and close that hole, so about seven to ten days. 
and you're probably going to mist at least until callus formation. Misting for it for direct sticking uh, can be very different than the propagation environment depending on how you're set up, but just a general rule, you're probably going to be misting at least until callus formation, maybe even longer, and then it depends on if you've started with the callus cutting um, and things like that. So and here's a picture of that dibbler that I talked about here where um, you know, you're just creating that hole for the cutting to go in, and the, and the, cuddling may, the cutting may seem kind of wobbly, um, you know, until you water it in with the nutrient solution seven to ten days later, but it really does uh, help with uniform roots and faster rooting if you dibble that hole. And then just pay close attention to sticking depth. I see this a lot when I visit greenhouses that direct stick, where, you know, one cutting in that pot was stuck too deep, and in a three plant per pot eight inch and one cutting is stuck like that, you're going to end up with problems all the way down the line because you're either going to lose that cutting or it's going to be uh, delayed severely. So just pay close attention to sticking depth. All right, Ellen, I'm going to go through questions quick and, and see if there's any that we can address during this section. Do you have any additional comments while I'm looking at questions? I, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I do have a good you question. Caught, you, caught, you, caught, you caught me off guard. Oh, so. sorry. I've got a good question here that's come in. Um, this particular grower does notice a difference in the speed at which different cultivars are uh, forming roots. And so they're wondering if we have any data that's available that classifies varieties by um, how quickly they root. And if we can just make any quick comments today about varieties that you know we know can be rooted in four weeks and those that would take five weeks. Uh, Actually, it's a, it's a, it, that's a good question because we internally uh, at Duman we've been talking about doing that because we, we do actually the color labels we send with uh, different geranium cultivars uh, actually go by uh, rooting speed. So we have actually internally talked about doing that for poinsettias. And now that we have uh, a lot more poinsettia cultivars uh, between the, the two brands, uh, I think that uh, we'll certainly look at that. Uh, I would say that yes, there is differences. Uh, for me to sit here and give you a list right now, I'm not going to do that because I would probably be wrong. But uh, it is something that we're thinking about, uh, and I suspect within uh, next year certainly we will have that list, uh, and uh, hopefully we can do it by uh, label color, which would be really nice because that gives you what we do with geraniums. You stick all the all the colors together, and then you have all the uh, Different rooting speeds uh, separated, and you have a uh, you know you can handle them differently. So yeah, good question, uh, and it's certainly something we're going will do. Okay, uh, this question is um, related to the pH of the media, which is is sort of related to fertility, but we can address that now. Is there an optimum pH for media, Ellen, when we're propagating? Well, I mean. Certainly, uh, we want to have it, uh, the, the media pH needs to be the same as the growing pH. So, you know, somewhere between 5.8 and 6.3 for poinsettias. And yes, too low, too high can, can definitely affect rooting. Okay, another question that's come in is where I had mentioned to increase uh, light on day 20 and how many foot candles would that be. And, you know, generally we say 1,200 to 1,500 foot candles, probably closer to 1,200. Um, you know, during the first 21 days. After day 21 is when we'd start to go above that 1,500 threshold. Um, generally, most cuttings that come out of the propagation environment have been acclimated to anywhere between 15 and 1,600 foot candles of light. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, that's really going to base, be based on individual environments. You may have to shade more than that to control heat because it's also, you know, shading isn't just to reduce light, it's also to control heat. And so if, if you know, you're like some growers that have your 100 degree days or 90 degree days in July and August or June and July when you're trying to propagate, 1600 foot candles may just be way too much for that amount of heat. And so, you know, that's a guideline, 15 to 1600, but it may end up having to be less than that just to control heat. So would you agree yeah, with I, that, Ellen? You no, know, I agree totally with that. Uh, I always say with points out as, uh, and I know that, that I'll get in trouble for saying this because, you know, there are always exceptions, but for poinsettias, to me, they always, once they're rooted and once they're growing, the more light, the better. And the only reason you put shade on poinsettias, to me, in the middle of the summer is to control heat. And, and I, 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 that's one of the things that well, we're not talking about later production, but uh, in September, October, if you don't need shade to control heat, you shouldn't have shade on poinsettias. 
they they poinsettias are southern you know they're a tropical crop the more like the better so the last question that's come in um, pertains to rooting hormone and the question about IBA versus NAA and the question is you know which component is more important for poinsettias um, and I should back up also and say that most powder formulations or none that I'm aware of actually contain NAA also. The powder formulations are basically just IBA and that's the critical component for, for poinsettias. Um, there's been some work done comparing IBA to NAA using a combination of both and um, or using one or the other. Poinsettias don't respond very well to NAA, NAA alone. Uh, they respond better to IBA and so you know when you're using the powder formulation and that it contains IBA then it's sufficient. So. Hope that's addressed that question. All right, uh, we're going to keep moving in the presentation, and Alan's going to talk with us now about mist management. Yeah, and I'll try to. Yeah, I see we're time wise, so I'll try to be a little little faster now. Uh, probably mist management is uh, improper misting, as we say on the next slide, is probably the number one reason for poor rooting. No question. Uh, we use we often use too much mist and when you use too much mist you leach nutrients that's why cuttings get real yellow uh, it cools the media slows rooting uh, actually it not only cools the media but it saturates the media so you get less air in the media particularly some of the medias that uh, you know hold a lot of water uh, you increase botrytis uh, and you get uneven growth it is is I, I think uh, I know exactly why we do it uh, if, if you're going to err, you err on the side of, uh, you know, not burning cuttings from too little mist. So we tend to go the other way and put too much mist on because that way we never burn the cutting, but we also slow rooting and we make miserable cuttings. So improper misting is, is really. Uh, what are the misting guidelines? Uh, well, you need to have the mist ready when you're stuck because actually the better thing is to have the mist on while the people are sticking. I know a lot of people don't like to work on their mist when it's misting and they're sticking cuttings, but usually I find in hot greenhouses a little mist uh, actually has a cooling effect on people too. So actually the best thing I've seen is people actually running the mist while the people in there are sticking if, you, if, the, if your employees will tolerate it. Misting frequency uh, depends on light levels, temperatures, humidity, air movement, all those things. Actually, you should have very little air movement in a mist system because it just interferes with the mist. Uh, ideal mist, mist frequency, you really want to, what do you use mist for? You only use mist to wet the leaves. Mist should not wet the root media. You've already wet the root media. It, the cutting's not taking up any water. So the worst thing I see is coarse mist or too much mist, and you're not only wetting the leaves, you're saturating the media over and over and over again. So actually, the, my guideline is when you put mist on, you should only wet the leaf. You should not put on enough mist to wet, the, wet that root media again. Uh, maintain relative humidity 100%. That is the best thing in the world. Once, they, once the cuttings perk up, uh, the humidity at 100%, you've got the root media is wet, they'll root. Uh, you, the next slide is, uh, is mist guidelines, and, I, and I, I left this one in for the reason to make a point. Uh, this is a sample schedule. This is a sample schedule for a mist clock, and my favorite expression always is you've got to realize the mist clock controls the mist, but the grower has got to control the clock. You've got to look at the cuttings and you've got to control that clock by how much water you want to put on. On a, on a bright day, you obviously need to put on more mist than a dark day. Uh, so you've got to look at the cuttings. Uh, you know, you use the mist clock to, to help you make those decisions, but you, as a grower, you have to control the mist clock. And like I say, you only put enough mist on, you put it on frequent enough uh, in short bursts to wet, to keep the, to keep the leaves moist, but not to wet the media. Too much mist. Uh, you see the the cutting on the uh, cutting on the left is uh, is with proper mist. The cutting on the right, you can see less roots. You can also see uh, those bigger water roots uh, 
that uh, basically are you're trying to root stuff in uh, in water and and this is an oasis so uh, but if you go into some of the some of the soil uh, ellies or something like that that hold even more water uh, you know it, it has that tremendous impact that too wet or logged uh, forms poor roots and our different root system next <coughs> And and this one this one sort of reinforces exactly what I said, is a missing schedule depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. A grower has to watch that. Uh, you have to control the mist depending on what the what the environment and what the plant what the cuttings look like. Uh, and it's okay instead of turning the the whole mist system on. Uh, I I still remember the fog and nozzles, and I think we still have fog and nozzles around, although I see very little in the greenhouse anymore. But I would go buy some some mist nozzles and just mist around the edges if you need to instead of wet the whole bench. Uh, again, I would watch those areas that uh, where those uh, dry areas and try to figure out why they're dry. Uh, change the mist system, turn off the fans, uh, and and do that. The other thing is varieties are different. I mean, certainly the uh, the light leaves, the thinner leaves. Uh, Probably need a little bit more mist than uh, than things like uh, Prestige that uh, that has that uh, much uh, heavier leaf. So you got to look at it. You got to control it. Uh, what do you, what happens with excess misting? Uh, we sort of repeat exactly what we just said. You cool the media too much. Uh, you get large callus and the roots, uh, you know, as I hate to make the term, but I'll say it because it, it, it makes sense in a way. It doesn't make sense for plants, but, you know, if I were cutting uh, and I'm sitting in water, uh, why do I, why do I make new, I don't need to make roots. So uh, so just think of it like that. I mean, you know, is, is you got to, you, you really need to dry the media out sort of to, to force the, the root formation. Slow, uneven rooting, but dry this up on this stats. And if it's, you know, missed signs of, of too little mist, uh, if they wilt, if the cuttings wilt in the middle of the day, then you, you but again, you watch that and you apply mist to keep that from happening. Uh, and certainly uh, leaf roll, leaf scarring, uh, are all signs of you're not putting enough mist on. But I see that very little. I mean, yeah, this, this would be, uh, this would be too little mist. If they're wilting this bad, you don't want them to wilt this bad. But those leaves are dry. See, you you just want to form a mist. You want to form water on there to keep them uh, keep them wilting. Uh, water quality uh, certainly uh, you need to pay attention to water quality. We say that uh, you know if you if you measured water quality three years ago, you probably ought to do it again. Uh, certainly, it's something you really want to look at each year. Uh, certainly, poor water quality can uh, can be a problem. Uh, Nutrients too much, uh, you know, things like sodium and stuff in the water can be a problem. Uh, if you need to acidify, uh, you don't use phosphoric acid on poinsettias because we know that uh, phosphorus is not a good thing on poinsettia leaves, particularly in propagation. And then we talk about weighing agents uh, and surfactants, and water quality can can very definitely uh, something you need to pay attention to also. Next. Weighing agents, uh, I uh, basically uh, I think they're they're beneficial. Uh, I I know that there are varying uh, comments on on use them, not use them, uh, but I would say uh, capsule is is not a bad thing to to use. Uh, is use a low rate though, one to two ounces per hundred gallons. You don't need to use a lot of high rates because you can burn poinsettias with uh, with too much. But certainly, if you've got hard water, capsule, uh, capsule helps. And, and what it does is uh, if you put capsule on, uh, you don't get this beating that you see here. This, this is, uh, this, if when I see beating like this, then capsule would, would spread that out and you would get a wet leaf and you get a little better. You, ha you can use less water, basically, with, uh, with surfactants. And here you see uh, again the the uh, the beating of the water, and capsule will will clean that up, and you won't get quite so much beating uh, with with that. And typical, you know, like I say, some growers have have seen some burn with capsule. Uh, 
but I would say that happens usually in the four to six uh, ounces per hundred gallons range, not in the not in that one to two ounce range. Okay, let's look through the questions here. I don't really see that we've had any that have come in specific to me. Oh, here's one for Misting. So this particular grower has got some poinsettias in propagation right now, and they are on actually day 21, so at a point when Misting should be able, they should be able to turn the mist off uh, very soon or definitely significantly reduce it, but they're still seeing the cutting stress and get that kind of leaf roll. So is it an inadequate mist issue, or you know, do we need to be looking at something else? Well, I would, if I see that at this point, I would worry about, I mean, how well rooted are they? I, I would say if you're seeing, at 21 days, if you're seeing that stress, then I would say that they're not well rooted, which, uh, which means that uh, the rooting has been really slow. Uh, so I, I think you need to go back and look at, look at those earlier, look at the earlier, what you've done earlier. Certainly, if they're, if they're doing that, uh, you don't have any choice. I mean, if they're wilting during the day, but I look at the roots, I, I suspect you don't have very good roots on there. And the worst problem you got is if some of them are not doing that, some are, then you've got real uneven rooting. So you really need to look at the, the previous 21 days and, and try to improve that. Uh, obviously, it's too late with this crop right now, but I think that's what's gotten you in trouble. And it may be a light issue at this point, too. It, you know, it may be that your light levels are, are high enough that you're just not able to back off on... Uh, the mist at that point, so you need to find that balance between reducing light levels and keeping the minimal amount of mist on as possible because unfortunately the answer isn't just to keep throwing mist at them, um, it, you know, because that's going to further inhibit things. You probably really need to go back and pay attention to the environment, make sure that you're managing the humidity still and light levels. Okay, so we're going to move on to height management now, height management and fertility management, and I'll take us through the height management slides and then Alan can talk about fertility. Uh, some varieties can be successfully propagated without growth regulators. There are some compact varieties that do well. However, the propagation environment is warm and it's wet. Um, and poinsettias are conducive or sensitive to stress when it's warm and it's wet. And so, you know, just that environment in and of itself is going to create a situation where the cuttings will stretch. And so, uh, generally, you know, I recommend to growers to think about using growth regulators even on the varieties that, you know, are compact and could be, could be propagated without. Uh, because PGRs will tone the cuttings and help reduce stretch. They can improve, improve branching. Um, and then if, if your environment is such that, you know, you're having low light to control heat, but you're having to, and excessive misting has resulted in stretch cuttings, those cuttings aren't going to branch well. And so, um, you know, by putting on a PGR application and at least one, you can help uh, reduce or inhibit stretch, and then you'll have cuttings that branch nicely after transplant. Generally, B9 Cycocell tank mixes are what's most commonly used on poinsettias. Uh, Cycocell alone on less vigorous varieties is also acceptable. The rates are usually 12 to tw uh, 2500, 1200 to 2500 parts per million on the B9, and then 750 to 1500 parts per million on the Cycocell. 1500 parts per million on the Cycocell is high. Um, we can start to see some uh, marginal burn from the Cycocell at that rate. So, Generally, we see growers hover more around 1,000 uh, parts per million on the cycle cell. And that alone uh, is effective even on vigorous varieties, but if you're just using cycle cell alone, you might find that you have to use, uh, use, have to use it at weekly intervals. Rates are going to vary depending on conditions and by variety. So, um, you know, we don't want to just apply to everything without knowing a little bit about the variety first and what your uh, environmental conditions are like. And then paclobutrazole containing products are too strong for propagation, and they'll definitely slow rooting. Um, we, I, I get the question every year, can I try bonsai, you know, or s something like that, and it's just very strong. Uh, the stretch that you're going to see is not significant enough that it warrants something like a strong chemical with paclobutrazole, and uh, the effects on rooting are just too great. So in terms of frequency, uh, we usually like to see the first application go on 7 to 10 days after, after sticking, uh, so about the time of callus formation and when you see root initials. If a second, a second application is needed, that's generally at day 21. On those really vigorous varieties, if you're going to do a third application, we recommend generally just using only Cycocell, and that would be, you know, right before transplant. So uh, in that fourth week, very end of the third week, fourth week, and right before transplant. And then the one caution I would make is if you're using copper-based fungicides like Phyton or Camelot, to be careful with the B9 application. 
Um, so we recommend two sprays, uh, day 7 and day 21. Uh, generally, we recommend, so if you're in question about if you're going to need both applications or, you know, how much stretch you're going to see, generally I would recommend to do the first application and not skip the second. The first application is really where you're going to kind of uh, get the uniform growth from the cuttings. If you wait and skip the first application and then you start to get some stretch, sporadic uh, stretch throughout the cuttings, it's going to be hard to, you know, you can stop the stretch, but you can't correct the stretch. And so um, by making that first first application, you can start off, start off nice and uniform and then make the second application if needed. And here's a picture here where, um, you know, the cuttings on the top, the first spray was skipped. So we've got one cutting that's nice and compact, one cutting that's stretched. Uh, same thing on the bottom. Well, if, you know, if you make the first application, then you get that uniformity. Uh, but if you skip that application and come back, it's hard to correct for it. And you're just going to, you know, you're going to slow them where you're at, but that stretch that's going to reduce branching um, has already happened. And this is a nice and uniform crop that, you know, they've got their uh, growth regulator really dialed in. All right, that's it for height management. Alan's going to talk with us about fertility, and then we'll have some time for questions. Yeah, fertility, uh, the, main, the main thing here is that you need to feed cuttings. Uh, it's seven to ten days, so you need to start fertilizing. Uh, once they start forming callus, and certainly once they form root initials, uh, you need to put fertilizer on. It really helps a lot. I think growers are concerned sometimes about putting fertilizer on because they think they can get giant cuttings, uh, but actually you get a much better cutting with fertility. Uh, I would suggest something like 21-5-20, uh, 18-3-18. Uh, the reason for that is uh, really low ammonium at that stage uh, to reduce, uh, you, know, you don't make cutting soft. Uh, and so less ammonium will make a make a harder cutting. Uh, low phosphorus reduce stretch. Uh, the phosphorus level should be below 10 percent. Uh, and uh, but it doesn't mean no phosphorus. It just means low phosphorus. So it is important to put phosphorus on. Uh, we don't often we don't most often don't recommend uh, fertilizer in the mist for uh, for poinsettias. Next slide. Uh, the uh, and the reason for that is uh, is algae, uh, particularly in the, the hot July August time of year, uh, more fungus snats, uh, and then certainly uh, with poinsettias, uh, phosphorus uh, can really uh, burn the leaves and distort the tips. So uh, so that's why we really don't don't recommend it uh, in the mist. And then obviously uh, one mist doesn't feed all. Uh, one feed doesn't fit all with particularly light leaf and dark leaf cultivars and vigorous differences and stuff. So probably in poinsettias, it's just best not to uh, not to uh, fertilize in the mist. And then a picture of just to remind you, uh, we you know all of us see this every year, uh, particularly the one on the left, and everybody immediately thinks that uh, you've got some strange disease, and the disease is uh, you put phosphorus on overhead, and it causes this scarring on poinsettia leaves. So. When, when you do fertilize uh, the cuttings, uh, you really want to wash the fertilizer off uh, with clear water. <coughs> okay, one of the questions that's come in is regarding growth regulator and our thoughts on using Florel in propagation. We know about the Florel sandwich technique around the time of pinch, so is there any benefits to using it early in propagation for a growth regulator? My my yeah, I, I would say no. I, I see no reason for for using Florel on poinsettias. And the comment I would make also, and that is, Florel is, you know, it, it triggers an ethylene response in the plant basically, and it's, it's stressful. Um, and the prop, the cuttings are already under stress. And as, actually, also on a poinsettia, it's got mild growth regulator effects, really. Um, and so it's not going to be that effective in propagation. It's going to create more problems and it's not going to be as effective as something like B9 Psychocell. Better used, you know, during the vegetative growth phase and around the time of pinch than in propagation. All right, we're going to talk about insect and disease management now. And the first comment um, that I will make, and Alan will also talk about this with, when it comes to insects, is that environment plays a critical role in disease management. Uh, Ellen spent a lot of time talking about sanitation. That's going to go a long way in terms of reducing the incidences of waterborne pathogens. 
Um, and then controlling heat in the first three days will help with the incidence of Erwinia. So those are two different ways that in interaction from the environment can help reduce the disease that you see in your greenhouse. And then also proper, proper environment is go, going to allow you to only use the amount of mist necessary, um, which uh, when we're using more mist, Ellen talked a lot about how that results in incident, more incidence of botrytis. So really want to pay close attention to environment, and that will go a long way in terms of disease management. Um, environment also plays a critical role in insect pressure, and Alan will talk with us about insects, but, um, you know, algae in and around the greenhouse promotes fungus gnats. Uh, you can have issues with thrips or white flies and weeds, and so we really want to start with a clean, clean environment is the key. The first disease I'll talk about is botrytis. Uh, it obviously thrives in a propagation environment because it's warm and it's wet. Sanitation is really important. Um, and minimizing the activity that you see on the bench and the spread of spores. If you do see any yellow leaves, um, you know, that's the because the cutting was stuck too deep or it's been stressed from shipping, et cetera, those leaves need to be picked. You need to do leaf picking. Uh, if you allow those, allow those senesc leaves to sit in, on the propagation bench, they're going to harbor botrytis, which can spread to the healthy cuttings. There's a number of fungicides that are effective. Uh, for botrytis control, and most growers are doing some type of preventative rotation rather than waiting for suppression. Um, but some of those chemicals would include Chipco, Dacnil, Decree, or Heritage. Um, the fact of the matter is botrytis is like Erwinia. It's there. Uh, it's ever present in the environment, and so we just need to do what we can to minimize the impact of it. Some good pictures here of botrytis. Um, if those aren't cleaned up, it can actually spread to adjacent cuttings that are healthy and create quite an issue. So we just want to be, you know, routinely checking cuttings and leaf picking if issues do arise. Erwinia, we talked a lot about already, so I won't spend a whole bunch of time here. Um, it is sort of an opportunistic pathogen in that uh, the cutting needs to, uh, is, needs to be stressed. Um, it's exaggerated by heat and stress, and so generally those first three days in the propagation environment or when we're most likely to see Erwinia. If you can get past the first seven days, um, it's not going to be an issue. So if you see rotting after that point, it's likely not Erwinia. Uh, that's why we talk about keeping the night temperatures cool the first three days. Uh, sanitation is important. Um, making sure that you're sticking early in the day so that the cuttings aren't stressed, all of those things will help to reduce the chances of Erwinia. If you do see some pockets of Erwinia in the greenhouse because it is bacterial, um, you know, generally you're going to see those cuttings wilt down to, or, you know, go completely to mush. You'll see whole areas where you've lost that cutting. Um, you need to kind of clean up those areas and apply a copper-based fungicide. But again, after you get through the first three days, it's generally not going to be an issue. Phytophthora is kind of an interesting one that we don't often see in propagation. Um, it usually shows up about week three in propagation, and it starts out uh, where the canopy kind of wilts, even under mist. So, you know, for the grower that commented earlier that they're still seeing uh, wilting even after week three, um, you know, you want to get in there and inspect and see if you see any kind of lesions or anything on the stem. It usually presents itself as a dark, dark brown to black color, and it appears above the callus, uh, kind of up in the canopy. It's spread by the flow of water, so, you know, you will see it. it you can kind of see it start out in pockets where one cutting is affected and the cuttings around it just by splashing water. Um, Dacanil and Chipco are good choices for prevention of Phytophthora. There is a, a long list of chemicals. Uh, there have been some documented cases of resistant strains of uh, both Phytophthora and Pythium to subdue. So could be used in your rotation, but I wouldn't rely on it completely. And here's some photos of Phytophthora where you can see you've got kind of that black um, mushy lesion halfway up the stem. It looks sort of like Rhizoctonia would in the vegetative growth phase. Um, you know, and oftentimes this particular cutting here doesn't show any healthy roots, but sometimes the roots will look completely healthy, and it's more of a lesion on the stem. Um, and in that case, it's usually Phytophthora. The comment I would make here, too, is whenever you're in question, submit samples. Um, and, you know, so you know what you're dealing with. It's important for your supplier to know what you're dealing with and for you to know what you're dealing with so that you can make the appropriate chemical choices um, and sanitation going further. We won't spend a lot of time on scab because this is something that we typically don't see in propagation. It's called scab because it makes some nasty raised-like lesions with tan centers. Um, and then also when the cutting, when it becomes systemic within the plant, then it uh, triggers the gibberellic acid effect, and so you'll see excessive stretch of a cutting. Um, it is favored by hot, wet conditions, um, and it's spread by splashing water. So during propagation, 
um, you know, with mist or overhead, it could be easily spread. This isn't one that we commonly see in propagation. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, good chemical rotation for uh, scab, if you do see it in your greenhouse, would be to reduce the favorable environment. So, you know, obviously the cuttings need to be misted in propagation, but if you see it outside of propagation, reducing uh, humidity, splashing water, things like that will uh, help to prevent spread. But then you can also use a rotation of chemicals like mancozeb, uh, thiophanate methyl, which would be fungal flow clearies, uh, OHP, uh, 6676 or Heritage Phyton. Um, we do have a good tech sheet available on the rotation for scab as well. Rhizopus, kind of like botrytis, the same conditions that uh, favor botrytis are, um, you know, the kind of conditions that we would see where rhizopus is an issue. Really, we only see this, I really have only seen it in southern greenhouses before, um, but it's called old man's beard or uh, because it's a lot more fuzzy than botrytis. So if you see an infection and you just have got a lot of white, you know, fuzzy uh, looking stuff, then that's generally rhizopus. Pageant is the chemical of choice. Most of the chemicals that control botrytis will also work on rhizopus, but pageant works the best for uh, rhizopus. Xanthomonas has become, you know, more commonly talked about in recent years on poinsettias, not like Xanthomonas on geraniums. Um, it, it's not as detrimental, um, but it does cause use bacterial leaf spotting, so it causes kind of some pesky leaf spotting, and in propagation you would typically see it on the lower foliage. Uh, it's exaggerated by heat and excess water, spread by splashing water. Sanitation prior to the season is really important, so if you had it on your finished crop, the previous season, it actually can, there's documented studies uh, where it can carry over from season to season. So, you know, if you later used your prop house, um, you used it for finished poinsettias, and then you had some, it can carry over. Uh, the best sanitation choices would be chlorine uh, for xanthomonas. It is bacterial, so the uh, chemical rotation would be phyton uh, 27 or 35 or uh, Camelot could be used as well. The sprays need to be re uh, repeated once weekly. Don't want to use surfactants with the copper-based product. And then a lot of studies have also shown that there's a, a synergistic effect when you use something containing Bacillus subtilis, so C. or Rhapsody. Um, and then Protect DF uh, also will help with that. And you can use Camelot, but it's a copper salt. Uh, some growers have found that you do find some damage from using the copper salts. And if you do have an issue with xanthomonas, it's important to avoid other chemical sprays if possible. So, you know, if, if you're having to do a strict rotation for xanthomonas, um, any kind of insecticide sprays or fungicide sprays that you come in with, or even growth regulators that don't contain um, copper-based fungicide are just increasing leaf wetness. And so you can spread it just with your other sprays. So um, kind of a tricky chemical or kind of a tricky disease to deal with from that perspective. And here's a picture of what you would see. You kind of get these lesions with uh, halos that form around the lesions. Oftentimes it looks really uh, wet and kind of black and greasy looking would be a good description for it too when it's, you know, when you see it, especially in the propagation environment. All right, Alan, you want to talk with us about right. insects? Yeah, quickly, uh, to me the number one insect problem in propagation is like a snatch. Uh, and we don't worry about the fungus gnats, we certainly worry about fungus gnat larvae. The worst problem I see is once a cutting gets infected, uh, once, or once the root media around the cutting gets infected, you plant that cutting and you're going to continue to have a fungus gnat problem. So it is really important that fungus gnats be controlled in propagation. The first and number one thing is sanitation. Uh, the second thing is, is reduce the water. Uh, actually, uh, we know that the, uh, the uh, entomologists tell us the, the very best control, the things that fungus gnat larvae do not like is dry media. So if they can go through a drying cycle, uh, you will reduce the fungus gnat problem uh, monstrously. Uh, I would say that if you see some fungus gnats again, I would, uh, I think it's real important to, uh, to monitor fungus gnats uh, with sticky cards in propagation and just make sure you don't have them. If you see them there, uh, probably uh, chemical, something like Duragard, Safari, or Nemesis uh, is, is really good. I don't know. Uh, if you don't see fungus gnats, I'm not sure that you need to do it, but uh, with good IPM and, and monitoring, if you see them, then you really go and need to use a chemical 
uh, to control. Uh, and next, yeah, fungus gnats and you see what happens is uh, they they actually bore up into the stem, and uh, if you put get them in the cutting at this stage, uh, if it doesn't kill the cutting at this stage, it more than likely the cutting once you plant it and pinch it. Uh, and it starts growing, all of a sudden they begin to die, the roots look good, and the stem is dead. Uh, often I find fungus gnat larvae in that stem. So it, it is really, really important to control fungus gnat larvae in propagation. And then the next, the next one is, uh, is our dear friend that we, uh, we really all, uh, all don't like to talk about, but it's whitefly. Uh, there should not be whitefly problems in propagation. Uh, I have seen no cuttings this year with high fly on them, and, and we work, we're working very hard that we make sure that the cuttings you receive do not have white fly. Uh, it is something you need to monitor, though. You need to look at cuttings and monitor it. Certainly after the cuttings root, uh, white fly can come in. Uh, to me, the, the, the thing you've got to do with white fly is a really, really good monitoring program and make sure that uh, you know when they're there, you know they're there, and then you can begin to control them. Uh, next one, next slide, uh, is, uh, as we say here, we're working very hard to keep the stock free of insects. Uh, cuttings should be 100% free of white fly this year, no question. Uh, insecticide treatments, I'll recommend 10 to 14 days after sticking. Uh, and I, the thing is, I would, uh, you know, I would say this with uh, just a little bit of uh, a caution. Uh, it depends a little bit on where you are. If you're probably in the south uh, with a lot more white fly outside, uh, it may be a much more of a problem. But to me, the whole issue of white fly control is monitoring. If you find white fly with sticky cards, uh, then you need to you need to do some of the chemicals. And you see here is just a list of uh, chemicals. Is things like Tulsar Maverick, uh, Avid, Avid Maverick tank mix. Uh, Safari is probably, if you get a real white fly problem, Safari is probably the best chemical for for really a quick knockdown. And and I know last year that Safari probably most of the chemicals, most of the growers that used uh, when they really got into a really major white fly issue, uh, is Safari was the was the better choice in Sandby. But again, I come to you and say that uh, the thing is you have to monitor and you have to control. The question comes up, uh, somebody asked a question earlier about uh, uh, biological control for white fly. Uh, biological control can work for white fly. Uh, I would say that uh, if, if, you, if you get a real large population of white fly, then biological doesn't work well. Uh, but I would also say to you, biological control is something that is very specialized and takes a lot of management. And so, if you're thinking about biological control, uh, you need to you need to go to a good supplier that's supplying the biological control material and work with them very closely and make very very sure. But biological control is you cannot just come and put those biological pests in the greenhouse and forget it. It it actually takes a lot more management for biological control than it does for chemical control. So, uh, so you really need to work with a specialist on that. Okay, so the question that's come in, you know, pertaining to white flies, so really are you suggesting, Alan, that a preventative program is probably not necessary to have in place right away for white flies and prop, just because well, the... I mean, yeah, I mean, and I know, again, I, I, somebody will get, in, I'll get in trouble for making that statement, but I still believe that with a good IPM program and with a good program of monitoring, and if you don't have white fly, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think you need to go and put a lot of chemicals on immediately. Uh, it is that, I mean, I, the thing is, I see some greenhouses with no white fly pressures, and I would not spend my money to put a lot of chemicals on. And I, the whole, sorry, ahead. Ellen, I, I just would agree with that in that the propagation environment, white flies are not overly happy in propagation to begin with. It's, you know, they don't like all that water. Um, it's just not conducive to white fly populations. And so, um, you know, 
it isn't like fungus gnats in that it's conducive to fungus gnats because it's warm and it's wet. Um, it's not a natural place for white flies. So, you know, just scout routinely, you know, inspect the cuttings when they come in, have your yellow cards out, and have chemicals on hand ready to apply. Uh, but, you know, in general, anytime that the more chemicals that we're putting on, and we're going to be putting on growth regulators and fungicides already, um, you know, the less we have to put on, the better for a lot of reasons, and economics is one of them. And so I just would say scout carefully and, um, you know, then if needed, apply. But generally in propagation, our biggest concern would be fungus gnats, I think. Is yeah, and, we and, and like I say, the cuttings this year, I mean, all the cuttings I've seen this year have been very clean of white flies. So, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, you don't expect white fly in cuttings. Uh, you still need to look for them, but uh, you really don't expect them, and uh, I, I have not seen any this year. No, yep, that's a good thing. Okay, quickly we'll go through some common problems in prop propagation, and these are really some series of pictures uh, that you might be seeing yourself and wondering why you're seeing them. Uh, rapid environmental changes is pretty common in propagation. Um, you know, if you're using whitewash and it keeps raining and it washes off the whitewash and then the sun comes out in the afternoon, um, and light levels increase rapidly, you can see things like this kind of bleaching out. Uh, light leaf cultivars tend to be more sensitive to you know, high light, things like that. Um, you know, generally, it can kind of have like a scorched appearance and some yellowing. Um, first instinct for most growers probably with the light color would be that it's nutritional. Um, I would say in propagation, always look at your environment first. Um, that's probably going to have the most impact on cuttings followed, you know, by nutrition uh, down the line. And so look at your environment first anytime you're seeing especially this type of symptom in propagation. Heat damage uh, anywhere in the time from harvest all the way until it reaches your greenhouse or even when, you know, when the cuttings are being processed and ready to be stuck can result in this leaf yellowing. And basically what happens is, um, you know, the process of the, ca uh, the cutting initiating callus and roots relies on some stored carbohydrates in the leaf. And so there's kind of a natural sink process that takes place over a slow amount of time. When the cuttings get heated up, it accelerates that process, and so you'll get this marginal leaf yellowing. Um, and then what happens is the leaf will yellow enough that it senesces, which is what we see in this next picture here, where we've got a significant amount of leaf loss. The key here is to leaf pick uh, any yellow leaves that you see, because it is going to result in a secondary disease uh, problem with all of these, you know, dead and rotting leaves in the greenhouse. And so uh, we do our uh, the best, you know, we can, and we're actually improving on some of our techniques in terms of transit uh, time from harvest to, or time from cut to the cooler and things like that, all the way along the cold chain uh, to ensure that you receive cuttings uh, that aren't heat stressed. But if you do heat, if you do see cuttings that are heat stressed, um, it is important to leaf pick and then apply a preventative fungicide just because you know, you're going to have that dead tissue in the greenhouse. Generally, if a cutting loses a leaf from leaf yellowing, uh, it's not the end of the world. It still has other uh, leaves so that it can, you know, it still has leaf surface area and the cutting will root in the same amount of time. However, if you see significant leaf loss and it results in something like this cutting here where, you know, there's nothing but the growing tip left, it, it's going to delay rooting significantly. We never want to see this. So if you've had leaf loss to this point, you know, you need to let your supplier know. Uh, because this will definitely impact your schedule. Another thing uh, that we can see is cold damage in transit. Generally, cold damage is pretty distinctly different than heat damage, and then it generally affects the new leaves, and it can cause kind of a browning or blackening of the tip. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see it on a bag that's closest to the ice packs where the ice packs didn't melt, um, or we can see cold damage in the early spring when we're shipping cuttings for stock or something like that. Um, you know, and it isn't uncommon to see it this time of year, again, as I said, if, if it's close to an ice pack or something in the box. Not as difficult to deal with as uh, leaf yellowing, I think, just in that, um, you know, you may lose that leaf that's affected there in the picture, but you don't have the significant leaf, lo leaf loss like you would when a cutting gets heated up. Chemical damage, something to pay close attention to. Um, you know, the, uh, when drying conditions are poor in the greenhouse, and that's just because we're misting, it's the propagation environment. Sometimes you can see some issues with chemicals, and you can see here, you can just see where the cutting kind of pool, the chemical kind of pooled on that cutting, and it caused uh, some damage. Sometimes it's not the chemical itself either, it's the interaction with the environment. So 
we always want to make sure that we're applying, you know, once the cuttings are standing up and they're turgid and at the coolest point in the day in the greenhouse um, when the mist can be turned off and the cuttings aren't stressed. So again, may not be the chemical itself, but more the interaction with the environment. Fertilizer damage, uh, Alan already talked about this, where there's too much phosphorus, and, and this is why we wouldn't want to fertilize in the mist, so that we don't see that accumulation of phosphorus in the tip. And physical damage, um, you can see this all the way from, you know, mishandling of the cuttings to too much airflow uh, in the greenhouse. You can see kind of that, you know, beat up, kind of scarred looking cuttings, and it's generally physical damage. So I'm going to let Alan take the last three slides, and it's just kind of an overall reiteration of what we talked about today and the reasons why we can see trouble in propagation. Yeah, the, uh, we say here the five top reasons for uh, uh, they root poorly is uh, too, too much light, too bright. As I say, if you want to err, you, we, we have to err on too little light or too, you know, less light than more light. Uh, so sometimes if you don't have movable shade, you got to put too much shade on, but you really you really want to have that minimum. Uh, too wet, too much water, uh, we, we still, you need to pay attention to that. I know you always don't like to burn cuttings, but I'd rather see one or two, uh, you know, not, not the whole crop, but I'd rather see one or two edge plants burned than to see everything else sopping wet and slow to root. Too little humidity, uh, too much airflow in the greenhouse. Uh, turn the fans off and make the mist. Uh, you know, keep the humidity up. Rapid environmental changes. Uh, you know, from real bright light to low light, or from real dry to real wet. Uh, those kind of things. And then poor sanitation. I mean, you know, just uh, Arwenia is is around, and if you don't clean everything and put cuttings on clean places, uh, you get you get disease problems and, and rooting problems. And uneven rooting, uh, too cold. Uh, remember, every propagator should have a thermometer in their shirt pocket. Uh, you need to monitor that. Too wet, uh, we, keep, uh, we said too wet about 500 times, so uh, hopefully that <laughs> sneaks in. Uh, too dark, uh, too much growth regulator are too bright. I mean, all of those things are too something. So, uh, so remember, uh, it's it's that modern, is that moderate, uh, moderate place you want to be, not too something. But a grower, as a grower, you've got to look at the crop. I mean, you know, we can give you guidelines and we can give you things that you need to pay attention to, but you still have to look at that crop every hour, every day, and make decisions and, and change the mist and change the temperature and change the light. Uh, to give the plant exactly what it needs. And then lastly, uh, uneven growth, uh, not grading at the plant. Uh, I would say on cutting particularly is make very sure that, you know, we like to say that every cutting root is exactly the same, that every cutting is exactly the same height, but uh, do some grading when they get ready to, when they're rooted and you get ready to plant them, do some grading. and. You'll be better off to put uh, put the smaller cuttings in one pot, particularly if you're planting multiple pots, or uh, put the big cuttings in one pot. And even if you're planting just single pots, keep the uh, if you can get the the bigger cuttings on one bench and the smaller cuttings on another bench, it makes the grower's life a lot easier. It takes a little bit of time doing that, but it's a lot easier to do it when you're planting or when you're sorting cuttings than uh, later in the crop. Uh, improper timing of PGR applications, uh, too much application or too wrong chemical, uneven temperature, uneven light. Uh, yeah, interesting, I go in, I see shade sometimes, uh, you know, you, you want to do a little bit of shading, so you open the shade a little bit, and then you've got strips of really, really bright light. And that just causes uneven, uh, uneven growth, and so you need to pay attention to that. Uneven rooting, uh, you know, don't separate, uh, well, do separate the cuttings, uh, grade the cuttings when you plant them, and then uh, uncover uncover those steps because that just, that will cause an ununiform rooting and ununiform growth. Okay. You know, we don't really have any last questions that have come in uh, that we didn't talk about earlier. I will say that I will go back through the questions. Uh, when I generate my report from the webinar, and if there's any that we didn't address, we'll address those via email after the presentation. 
Uh, we have had a lot of comments come in also that people would be interested in having a copy of the presentation, and so that is something that I can do. Um, I can email out like a PDF of the notes slide or something so that you can have the material. And again, it is recorded uh, and will be available for viewing later, so you can go back and use it as a reference. So well, that I, I, I would also say, I would also add that thanks to all of you who are listening. Uh, I, I'm amazed that, that we've had a lot of people stay around. We've been a little longer than we said we're going to be, so a lot of people stayed around. So that's uh, that's a pleasure. So uh, so I appreciate that. Yeah, we definitely appreciate your time. This was the first time Ellen and I have presented together, and so um, it was a it was a pleasure um, to be able to be in you know sort of in your greenhouses today, talking with you about poinsettia propagation. And uh, we thank you for your time. And on behalf of the entire staff at the Duma Group, uh, we do appreciate your time and your business and. We uh, would encourage you to watch your emails for future webinars. We plan to do a few more uh, during poinsettia season. So again, thanks and have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.